It's a lovely day in Sydney at the moment. Nice and cold out there in your car. Coldest day yesterday, but nice today. Sun's not out. Uh, so, you know, the day's only young over here. Yeah. The other day it was um, a bottom temperature of, I think it was one degree Celsius in Canberra the other day. And we, we happened to go for a family drive up to Canberra for some stuff. But it was very cold. Uh, no, not by st- um, uh, standard with some of our listeners, I bet. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Just a couple of things at the beginning of the show before we get into the regular content. A quick happy birthday message to my mother. It's her birthday today. So happy birthday, mum. That's the number one thing. Um, Other news happening for you this week, John? Anything interesting? Yeah, look, it's been, uh, the phone's been ringing a bit, which is always a good thing. Uh, I went down to Murrum Bateman, I think I mentioned last week, and we had some good follow up with that. So, um, again, more interest in local councils and local government uh, getting, wanting to get into using uh, drones for their day-to-day work, and that's pretty exciting. So, you know, we're, we're pushing ahead with that, and it's a great initiative for the community, you know, because, of course, once the council starts using drones and they're in public safety and, and looking after their constituents, if I might say that, um, people see the aircraft as more friendly. So, you know, we're, we're getting some good news stories. And we're showing those guys how to sample their water tanks and towers and, you know. Mm. So, yeah, the, the future is looking good for that kind of stuff. Okay, cool. Speaking of the future looking good, we've got a an exclusive today. This is a um, preview of an ad for someone who's sold or selling a Phantom 5 um, prototype. They're actually selling one of the ones that they got their hands on. Let's just quickly put that up on the screen. <laughs> I couldn't resist. This one came in from one of our viewers, Thunderbird6. He reckons this is the Phantom 5 prototype that's being sold on Facebook Marketplace. Maybe not the Phantom 5 prototype. It's got five arms, but that's about the only five in it. But still like an interesting frame, one. Though. It looks like a good frame, you know, and I think I'm about to do a new frame and I'm going to try the new Matrice idea. I'm going to invert the engines and have them on mm-hmm. the bottom of the frame and, uh, and and just do a bit of experimenting with that because uh, I think there's a great way to sort of protect them a bit more by inverting the motors on the, on the arms. So, I mean, up until now, most of our aircraft have, have the props pointing upwards, but there's no reason why they shouldn't go the other way. Yeah. Okay. Well, with all of that intro over and done with now, let's quickly get into the news. And as always, Ausby Drone News is brought to you by Air Data UAV. Is your drone healthy or is it about to surprise you on your next flight? Don't wait to find out. Discover under the hood information and review the early signs of problems before you take off again. Use a discount code Ausby Drone 20 for a 20% discount. There's a link in the description. And right off the bat, thank you very much to Artco for the $5 Super Chat. Very much appreciated. Thanks for that, Art. So our first news story today, rather ironically, is the Art drone. That couldn't have been timed any better. Um, in this story, a series of machine-based abstract... Mm. Let's... Uh... That is a little bug in some of our stuff, and I don't know why that happened. We'll fix that later. But I like a series it. of a series of machine-based abstract paintings titled "Dot" are on display in New York. The presentation features vivid artworks made using drones. The gallery room housing the works initially served as an installation space 
where the artist flew a drone to spray a programmable random pattern of dots on seven blank white canvases. Katsu, the artist, developed the drone technology in Russia with programmers and engineers. That is a really cool use of drones, basically turning a drone into a dot matrix printer. So what you could you think if you extended that, if you were sign writing and stuff and you had real accurate spray, you could put signs up at high on high places and stuff? I mean, that, that's interesting. You Why not? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Look, we've seen we've seen the the painting stuff before, but that's more um, brush stroke style painting. This one's like dot matrix painting, and I think it's a really cool use of drone technology. Yeah, I reckon next time I play paintball, I'm going to have a look at that too. <laughs> okay. Now, while we do look at some things, there's something on the screen there from Twitter, which was a sample tweet that was up on the screen for some reason. I'll make that go away. Let's go on to our, by the way, we are using the next version of Wirecast today. So any weird things that happen, um, I'll let you know when and if anything goes well or not so well. We'll see how we go. Our second story today. Um, in Australia, we have, you know, slang words for things as we've all seen before. You know, uh, mosquito, we call them mozzies. And the next one is our mozzie drone story. It's often been said that drones sound like a mosquito. The University of Southern Florida is doing research, bringing drones and mosquitoes closer than ever before. Pest control of mosquitoes first requires knowledge of the mosquito habitat. The researchers have been using drones to capture images, which are then fed into an AI algorithm to lo locate mosquito breeding drones at scale. Let's have a look. So as the 35th anniversary year of the University of South Florida College of Public Health, we've been focusing on what we'd love to call cool things we do, and public health is full of interesting challenges. Ben Jacob is uh, perhaps one of the most creative and passionate faculty members we have, tackling one of the world's um, persistent public health challenges, malaria, using technology, using his knowledge of uh, community engagement, geography, meteorology, he brings all of these things together in an effort to find mosquitoes where they live and breed and stop that process. So uh, our drone pilot, Nate, he's our PhD student at CFP, he's about to put up the drone. We'll be looking for getting some signatures from some of these uh, aging habitats along the edges of these swamps. fade the audio down there as they continue to explore but John what do you think at a high level the idea is getting some footage of uh, the habitats and feeding that into an AI algorithm yeah well you know this is uh falls under the species tracking I suppose Mo it's a great a great thing I mean mozzies can carry all sorts of nasty diseases um and you know there's a fair bit of interest in it but of course the next level would be to sort of have maybe have some control if they've got you know infectious mosquitoes who knows i mean I, I i'm impressed that you know thinking how big mosquitoes are and how these guys are working and what they're using is using uh, obviously using a dji aircraft there great stuff every I'm time not joking. i'm not uh, every joking. time <laughs> every time we change the shot today for some reason it's talking to title alive and doing some weird things that's something new that i haven't seen before um Keeps the we'll show interesting. If... <laughs> just leave it for the moment. We'll see what happens. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, look, there we go. There's a title that I'm happy to see. $10 from Wayne King. Hi, Greg and team, and a $10 super chat. Hi, Wayne, and thank you for that. Thanks, Wayne. So, so yeah, controlling mosquitoes. Um, detection, finding their habitats first at scale, I think, is a really cool thing. Obviously, you've got to then do something about it. Uh, you're a brave man, Greg. Why crash beta? Um, okay. <laughs> I, you know, just on the on the species tracking thing, Greg. If you're interested, I've got a friend mm. who's in the Atherton Tablelands who tracks and monitors tree kangaroos. Now, uh, some of you overseas may not have heard this, but there is a kangaroo that lives in trees. It's got kind of the the claws at the front and actually uh, habitats trees. It's kind of a weird. But um, I think that 
it, there's going to be a lot of application to this for sure. Okay, absolutely. We did have a little freeze there. It's um, yeah, we've got drop bears and now drop kangaroos. They're living in trees. Is that yep. what I'm hearing? That's what you're hearing. Drop kangaroos. Okay. <laughs> So our next one today, in River Heights, Utah, a tenant warned that, speaking of animals, uh, the tree-cutting crew, um, that high up in the dead ponderosa pine tree, there was a bird's nest. Property owner David Johnson used his unmanned aircraft to take a peek. The drone footage helped to identify and save that hawk's nest in the tree. Just some nice footage there and a good use of drone technology as well. That's nice. I'll just wait a little moment so we can get over the top of it. Have you used um, your your aircraft or any of your aircraft in any nature and conservation kind of applications yet yourself, or is it ma mainly the commercial side? Uh, for uh, me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, look, absolutely. Um, you know, bird's nest and all that kind of stuff. Um, mostly looking at birds' nests that are in towers um, where they've sort of, you know, can be quite dangerous in communications towers. But, you know, for habitat monitoring and stuff, it's it's going to be fantastic. I mean, you, you're relatively not leaving a lot of damage on the footprint. You're not climbing the tree. You're not freaking the bird out. Of course, the, the aircraft itself, um, if it's too close, might. But, again, if it's used for the right reasons, you know, there's a lot to be said for doing helping the environment for sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. We've got two more quick stories. And speaking of the environment, something that we spoke about the last couple of weeks with regard to um, fire grounds. And in this story, um, flying near fire grounds has significant risk to your aircraft. Um, thermal activity associated with fires can cause your aircraft to perform in unexpected ways. But that's not the only risk. Firefighters use aerial firefighting techniques. And if you fly, they can't. In recent weeks, we did discuss this a few times. Uh, this is a reminder to all pilots to avoid flying around fire scenes. ends when you fly one near a wildfire. There is a lot of low-level air traffic over a wildfire and pilots are focused on their mission. Unexpected aircraft, even small drones near a fire, puts lives at risk. No drone flight or picture or video is worth a life. Not only is it a bad and dangerous idea, only authorized aircraft are permitted to fly near wildfires. Drones and wildfires don't mix. Be smart, be safe, stay away. So it's a pretty obvious video, but um, it's something that we unfortunately do see on a regular basis in the clips that come through our feed. Yeah, we do. Um, I think the temptation, you know, when there's something's going on to fly, um, you know, is, is great. And, and that's where people sort of make the wrong choice. Um, about it i mean you can actually if you roll up to where a fire is being monitored from uh in australia anyway you can be uh and get approval and, and be asked to help out if you've got an airplane um that there's that's in the legislation here that um mm. provided you've got permission you can actually help help the guys out but um just random flying around fires now that that's a no-no pretty much everywhere yeah it's common sense okay yeah, absolutely. I've got one more fun story before we um, go and have a chat to our guest. And this one is a dragon of a story. This drone prototype, which was aptly named a dragon, can completely shift its shape while flying. I have a dream uh, when I was a child. You know, I'm from China, so we, we are also dreaming of the, the dragon. I'm Mojo Zhao from JSK Robotics Lab in the University of Tokyo, and I'm the assistant professor in this lab. You know, there are lots of kind of the bio-inspired robots. Uh, people make the robot dog or, or robot uh, cat. But I, uh, the dragon is not a real animal, but it's a kind of holy sh uh, symbol in Asia. Imagine this robot like a flying human arm to do the manipulation on the air, so you can change the, the lamp instead of humans or to open the door like a human arm or you can also think uh, this robot uh, can transform like a snake so it can exploration in a very narrow space so i think this is one of kind of application in the disaster rescue my name is tomoki anzai master course student of the university of tokyo 
So each link of the dragon has uh, a small circuit board named neuron, and each, each board communicates each other. So by this structure, dragon can fly stably in, in the air. Hello, I'm Shifan. I'm the second year master student in the University of Tokyo. Previously, my research is mainly related to this robot called Hedros. I want to make faster dynamic motion of this robot, like play table tennis. And uh, for future work, I will work with Dragon to make more complex uh, dynamic So I'm just going to fade that out there. So we there kind of get the idea of what he's doing, but um, That's very, very, it's abs more than incredible. It's amazing. And um, there's one part of the clip where you go and see him create a square in the middle of the um, uh, room that he's in. I'll just let it play out while we chat about it and see if we can get to that bit. And he goes and flies up vertically through that space, and then there's a net above it, so he can't fly too high. Can you imagine <clears throat> what the controller look, looks like for you know, flying this thing? There is no controller. It's all um, driven by software, and you need to give it the parameters of what you want it to do. And um, it will then go and execute these, these commands. Um, well, again, this design out of Tokyo. That's incredible. Just trying to get my head around how that software works. We're going to see a bit more of that. That's amazing. Yeah. Incredible story. And um, we've got to the point in our show now where we've finished with the first half of the news and it's time to bring in our guest. Hello yeah. and welcome, Tom. <laughs> and there we go. Hey. Stayed a little bit longer. There we go. Hey, Tom, how are you doing? Hi. Hi, Greg. Thanks for having me. Okay. It's doing funny things again. I'm just going to turn off that title shot. If anyone's got super chats um, and things like that, I won't know about it. Apologies. But good to have you, Tom. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm fine. So t whereabouts in the world are you from? Uh, I'm from Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, Canada. Okay, and uh, you're, you're, you're definitely a lot younger than the other people up here on the audience and you don't yet have the receding hairline. So what, what are you doing flying drones if you're a young teenager? <laughs> uh, so I started a drone photography company this spring. Okay, and w what are you doing with that? What type of drone photography work have you been doing? Uh, so right now I'm working with a couple of businesses and uh, real estate agents and also I'm doing some personal photography. Okay. So you just mentioned some real estate photography. We, our first clip that we've got from you is exactly in that vein. And um, wh where were you filming in this location? Uh, so I was on a, a busier strip of, uh, of town where uh, there's a lot of car dealerships and there's this, this lot that's kind of wedged in the middle and it's, uh, it's kind of hard to see. And the, the drone shot of it is perfect for uh, exposure and selling the property. Yeah. Okay. And what type of property was it? It was an industrial warehouse of some sort? Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, I think it was like a contracting warehouse. Okay. And how long have you been flying and what was your aircraft when you were doing this? Uh, I've only been flying since, I think, uh, early June. I fly with a Mavic Air 2. Okay. And this is obviously not anything to do with real estate. This is you having some fun. Is that you on the bike? Yeah, no, that is, uh, that's my friend Nathan Jones. Okay. Um, you'll, you'll definitely have to meet up with Ken Heron because he, he loves green bikes. Um, he's um, riding everywhere all the time. And you made this as a kind of a creative art piece or what yeah, was the this background? Was a, uh, this was just a fun project we, uh, we decided to do. Okay. And what other kind of things do you do? Do you fly just for fun as well? Like you've got the Mavic 2. Um, do, do you do any other type of aircraft flying as well? Have you got any um, FPV aircraft? Uh, no, I do not. I don't yet, but uh, I plan to get some uh, first person view drones in the future. Okay. And what, what made you decide to want to get into this in the first place? Uh, opportunity. There's so much opportunity, especially where I live for drone photography and aerial footage of buildings and uh, people that 
it's just uh, it's definitely just a great opportunity and I want to be a part of it. Okay. We've got one more piece of um, footage from you, which is um, really nice as well. What are we looking at here? Where is this? This is close to your house? Uh, so this is a place called Hiawatha Highlands. It's, uh, it's around 50 minutes away from my house. It's, uh, it's beautiful in the summer and it's even nicer in the winter. Uh, it, uh, they do cross country skiing and mountain biking and all sorts of things. And there's this big, nice waterfall that goes right down the middle of it. I'm curious, are you a Mac or a PC user and what do you use for your video editing? Uh, I use Mac. Uh, a lot of my a lot of my video editing is uh, is actually on the DJI app. I think it's perfect for what I need it for, and uh, it, it's it's a lot more powerful than I expected. I I do a little bit on iMovie, but not much. And I also use Photoshop and Lightroom for my photos. Okay, um, John, have you got any questions for our young aspiring drone pilot? Yeah, look, I, I'm I'm impressed. I'm just looking because I haven't flown uh, the Mavic Air two uh, yet. So you know that's what I'm looking at first. I, I haven't haven't had my hands on one. I don't know how many of our users are using them yet in comparison to the Mavic two. But you know, right up away with the aircraft, I hear it's a really really um, a good machine, and uh, you know the the images look good. But um, yeah, the, it reads well that the airplanes for you know where it's priced and everything, what it's capable of. It's a good starter as well, you know. It's a it's a great machine to start with. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's great for everything I use it for. It's got a really nice camera. It's got a forty eight megapixel camera and uh, takes stunning images, in my opinion. How, how much research did you do, Tom, when you were looking at? Well, am I going to buy a Mavic Two Pro or the Mavic Two Air? Did you go through that process and weigh them up? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so a lot of it was my budget. So I got yep. a fifteen hundred dollar grant to start my company from the local economic development center. So it obviously had to be below that. I was looking at a couple para drones, but I decided the Mavic Air two in the end. Yeah, and are you operating under a waiver yet? Have you gone down that path, or are you just just operating recreationally? Uh just recreationally right now. Yeah, so obviously your your company, or you know, now you got started. That'll be the next thing to to look at in terms of getting one hundred and seven uh, in place, so that you can your company can do a lot lot more of course and then you can insure yourself and a few other bits and pieces you know one of those things that um i've been working with various people getting into that going from okay i'm flying and i want to, my business to expand what are going to be the build you know the hold-ups for it um and so would you get go for another grant to go to take your company onto that kind of platform uh i think so i think there's a couple more uh things that i can apply for that i, I probably will in the future yeah, good. Yep, no worries. Um, no, the footage is great. I, I'm, I'm impressed with the airplane. Yeah, I'm curious in terms of the regulations in Canada. Um, are you? Ha, how does that work if you don't yet have um, a, a license or a certificate of any kind? Are you able to do commercial work over there uh, as long as you're within the standard rules? That's what we have in Australia. Is that the same in Canada? I guess. Uh, I actually do have my my certificate. I'm I'm sorry for the confusion there. I have my um, my basic operations license. I think that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can't fly without that. There's it's pretty strict over here in Canada. And mm -hmm. if you don't have at least what I have, uh, you can't do much. Okay, and you, you can't you're fly at all. You need a certificate to before you can fly at all. I I think so. Yes. Okay. It's uh, it's a lot. I I have heard that the Canadian drone laws are pretty strict. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's yeah. very strict. And we're getting that way at some time in the near future. Um, mm -hmm. We've got some stories later on in the news. Certainly, um, the Euro drone laws are changing in the very near future. We'll have a look at that in in a little bit. Um, but before we do, let's get into a little bit of um, fun and frivolity, and. For that, we are going to... Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time to play Stump the Yank. Well, in this case, we're not going to stump the Yank. We're going to cook the Canuck. Just a little bit of fun and trivia, some Australian stuff. Now, our honorary quiz master, Lloyd, helps us out because he's got a lot of friends that are Aussies, and then it's time to cook the Canuck. 
So, Lloydie, what have you got for us today, my friend? Better turn on my mic, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, these are just some uh, simple questions for our friend, our guest over here, for Tom. What have you got for us? Uh, well, actually, what I got is terrible because that's not where I usually go. So, let me... Ah, there we go. Because he's new to the show, I can use some of the old ones. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. What is the Aussie salute? Is it like this? Is it like this? Or is it like this? Uh, I'm going to have to go with option number one. No. Uh, the Aussie salute no. is like this because they're always <laughs> swatting flies away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, That's that fine. is the great Aussie salute. And um, for those of yes. you who may have seen, uh, we have the uh, the hat with the corks hanging down and dangling around as one of the ways that uh, Bushmen used to deal with that. But, yeah, that is the Aussie salute, waving the flies away. I have one for him. Okay. Oh, there you go. Here it is. Um, what is a dog's eye? Uh, is it uh, a, in, on the front of the dog? Is it on the back of the dog? Or is it a delicious pastry with meat inside? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You got me there. I don't know. I think... Uh, I hope it's the pastry. <laughs> I hope it's the pastry. Good and, why would it, and why yeah. would it be the pastry? Because the back of a dog's not going to be uh, probably the right, the, the best choice. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, answer yeah. to the question why it's correct is um, we've got rhyming slang in Australia and a meat pie rhymes with a dog's eye. So there uh, you go. And you, and you can have yeah. dead horse with it as well, which is red sauce or ketchup. So you have a dog's mm. eye with a dog's eye with dead horse is a, is a meat pie with, with ketchup. Mm. Nice Sorry, one, John. Wow. I like that one. Yeah, that was yeah. good. Yeah. That was a good one. Um, so have you got one more load and then we're going to go and do our other news stories. And um, if, if you're able to stick around, we'll keep you for um, our joking off a little bit later. But what have, what have you got? One more, Lloydy? It's an oldie but a goodie. What are budgie smugglers? Now, are they guys that uh, get the, because they have a lot of exotic rare birds over there. Do they smuggle the birds out of Australia to take them, you know, like the budgies, to take them to the United States? Or because we have some birds they don't, are they smugglers that bring them into, the Uni into Australia? Or are they speedos? I don't know. You got me again. Um, you know what speedos are, right? Yeah, yeah, I know what okay. a speedo is. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. I don't think it's a speedo. I think it's actually uh, yes, it is. is. It a speedo? Yeah, yeah, it, it is, is the speedo. speedo. That's a bit too you got me. You got me. <laughs> about the, about the size of a budgie, because you've got to know what the size of a budgie is, and uh, and and then if you were carrying it in your pants or your undies, uh, that would describe it all. So speedos are, are yeah. smugglers. <laughs> yeah. We have a lot of weird stuff down here, I can and tell you. Just... A lot of weird stuff down under, yeah, Bontush. Right. But speaking yeah. of which, our, our former Australian um, Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, was famous for wearing his budgie smugglers when he was going out and doing surf lifesaving, and they always used to rib him about it. But uh, <laughs> there you go. So welcome to Australia down under. Moving Tom's right on. Moving right along, Tom, we're going to do another few news stories. If, you've, if you're able to stick around until the end, we're going to have a little bit more fun with a segment that we call Joking Off, where we get you to tell a few jokes and the other guys to tell some jokes and which are the best ones of the day. But um, it was great um, having you on as our guest, and I certainly wish you um, a lot of success as you go forward with your business in drone photography. Is that How do people get in touch with you? Make sure you put it in the chat room for us. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll attach my Instagram in the chat. Okay, Excellent. that'd be awesome. 
Okay, so let's move on and we'll go to our next drone story now. This one is speaking of budgie smugglers. We're going to have a look at spy drones. And uh, this one's a very interesting story. Um, the Golden Valley Police Department was flying a drone. Um, the public normally are concerned about drones being used by peeping toms, trying to watch people in the shower or topless bathing. Normally, you would call the police. But what do you do when the police are using drones to perv on you? Golden Valley Police Department used a drone to catch beachgoers breaking the law by going topless or nude. Tonight, WCCO's Jeff Wagner tells us why officers chose that tactic and why some feel the enforcement went too far. The serenity on this somewhat hidden beach at Twin Lake is what draws visitors, along with an understanding of sorts that many freely bear their bodies. Really well known for being a safe place to just be comfortable. But when Elsie Olin was there last Friday, that freedom of expression wasn't free from consequence. They're all wearing tops. They're literally wearing tops. As officers began taking information to potentially cite people for being topless or nude. It had reached the point where it was time for people to be held accountable for their actions. Detective Sergeant Randy Malin with Golden Valley PD said they've received more than a dozen complaints this spring and summer regarding people being nude, drinking alcohol, or doing drugs at the beach. Over the past weeks, he says... So um, I'll just stop the story there and share with you um, a little bit of the, the background. So supposedly, the people who said we're all covered up, supposedly earlier on, um, the drone caught them with their tops off. Now, the problem that I've got with this is you've got the perception of drones already being used to spy on people and to perv on girls and do things like that. And then you've got law enforcement doing just that. Yeah, you know, I don't know that it's a good, a good story for drones exactly. I mean, um, yeah, probably you're going to split your audience there and whether they think what what's sort of enforceable in terms of the law and what's reasonable and the place, you know, maybe there's other places where you can go and take your clothes off, um, and and you know if that's your thing, um, where where it's quite okay. But I mean, in Australia here, you know, most of our northern beaches around here are, are topless any anyway, and so it's not considered illegal. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a difficult one. I don't but know interestingly, why. interestingly, as a result of the story, there's been actually an uh, application to change the law and um, it's going before their council or their whatever their governing body is there to change the law for that location. Um, yeah. But the use of drones in that circumstance, I don't have a problem with the police using it, um, but for surveillance, um, I, I know there's a, a bill before the parliament in the US um, which is related to surveillance use of drones, and we talked about that before. Yeah, it comes um, on across another another issue here, and it's called lawful purpose. So it's one of the mm. things we've been working with councils, and 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 they're looking at swimming pool backyard swimming pool regulations. So here in Australia, the law says you have to have an enclosure around your pool, and this is to save kids from drowning in pools. And so this has been around; every state uh, complies with it. And so people sometimes build pools, they put a fence around it, they get it signed off and then they take the fence down. The council now are going to use, uh, you know, for build, uh, illegal buildings and pool, pool fencing and stuff, uh, drones to enforce that law. So they have, uh, in, in terms of a surveillance um, uh, legitimacy, lawful purpose. And lawful purpose is a, a term we're going to start seeing coming into our space in terms of if someone has that that lawful purpose, I mean, looking at you know, people who are taking their tops off, you know, that that's one end of the extreme. What about people do, doing illegal dumping, throwing into that same lake, you know, drums and drums of waste material? Um, mm. I, you, that's where your audience is going to split. You know, one's going to say, "Well, hang on, you know, don't forget about that. Let's go and use them for something a little more, um, you know, that that that's got purpose, got got an actual purpose." Mm. Most of us just want to know where they're doing that at. They yeah. Ask the police officer so we can find out. You know, ask the cops; they know. I mean, it's a gig, you know. I mean, so as a flying gig, that's something else too. You know, I mean. Yeah. Okay. Look, it's an interesting story. I I don't have a problem with lawful purpose for the other examples you gave, 
but I'm just trying to imagine the police officer with his goggles and yeah, you know, it's it's it just doesn't feel right. I can't. Go by there. the way, that law, of course, it's not with Parliament; it's with Congress. But that's they're they're only allowing it to follow for three days. Man, one afternoon of that, I would need two more days. That's all. You know, that'd kill me. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, well, as I say, the the, um, the whole idea of, of this is going to be tested, I think that's what we, we're really saying here. You know, where is the line going to be drawn um, for mm. this kind of thing? And and I think everyone's going to have their own opinion about that line, whether they're flyers even, you know, like mm. we're discussing it. And or whether they're just public that don't fly, and I'm sure they're going to have a very firm opinion about what they believe it's good for. <laughs> okay, thank you. Moving Lloyd. right along. Thank you for laughing. Thank you. <laughs> As we um, get past that, we're going to go to our next story, and this is about a drone swarm. And in the US, yet again, a city-based startup, Rancio, has been approved by the Federal Aviation Administration for the operation of multiple drone swarms nationwide. This allows Rancio to operate three autonomous drone sprayers by a single pilot and one visual observer. Labor shortages in agriculture are known and a widely discussed topic. With the ability to now fly three drones at once, they believe that they're moving closer to full autonomy and operation, which they want to help solve the labor requirements needed to feed a rapidly growing world population. So that's the story. But um, yeah, I like the idea of drone swarms now having an approval process. Is that something that's uh, anticipated for Australia? Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, at the moment, the law is pretty much around single operator, single aircraft at the moment in, in terms of our, our laws. The, I've had a company just this week contact me about it with a drone in the box example. They want to push button, uh, doors open, you know, the ideal things on charge, it flies up and does a, a mission, a certain surveillance job, and then comes back and lands in the box. Um, there are some great solutions out there, very expensive. If you've ever looked at that kind of technology, um, real expensive. Mm. Um, and so those sort of, I think, definitely we're going that. I've only mentioned it once before briefly, but under the legislation at the moment, we, in Australia, we changed to, from UAVs or drones to calling them remotely piloted aircraft systems and that the word pilots in there. And so a separate set of legislation is being developed for what we call autonomous drones. Um, and that will come under a completely different set of regs. There'll be, there'll be all sorts of things that go under that. I mean, a, a skyrocket, a balloon uh, and an untethered kite uh, or, you know, basically anything that flies without control is considered an autonomous vehicle. It does what it wants to do. It goes with the wind um, and, you know, fireworks going there. So there are precedents for aerial vehicles that don't have control. So we'll see what happens there. Mm, okay. Oh, it did it again. I was trying to get <laughs> this up on the screen. Let's try that again. Oh, it disappeared. It, it, are other people seeing between shot changes it goes black like between changing, is that something that you're seeing in the audience? Do let us know, but it's behaving weird on the screen. The Euro drone, I mentioned this before, so drone regulations are changing in the EU. What does this mean for you? Here's a short little clip from the regulator. Hey, so you're my new pilot. Wow, unbelievable. Before we can hit the skies, you've got some stuff to do. You need to register online, complete the training, and pass the test. Wow, that was easy. You're not just a pretty face. Good that you check beforehand where we can and cannot fly. Uh, oh, sorry. Even a smart guy like you knows better. Read the manual. You want to fly me or not? <laughs> Ouch, Paul. Are you serious? Keep me in sight, always. You don't want to lose me. Are you nuts? Don't fly me higher than 120 meters. 
and not too close to other objects, to airports, or over groups of people. Okay, I understand. Oh, cool, a pool party. Ouch, that's not funny, Paul. We can't take photos or videos of people without their permission. Flying a drone is really fun and not so complicated if you follow some rules. Register yourself, check where you can fly, keep the drone in sight, and do not fly above 120 meters or close to obstacles in airports. And do not invade privacy. Then, you're a really good pilot. So that's interesting that EAS has actually got the privacy aspect included in what they're publicizing. I don't know if it's actually part of the drone or aviation regulations or if it just happened to be um, packaged with it to try and pacify other people. Yeah, I think they're restating a lot of stuff that's in place already and a lot of it built around common sense um, there. But, you know, one of the things that is kind of weird about doing a cartoon to me, it, it takes the um, the edge off the fact that what you're doing is, might be unlawful. Um, you know, I just, I just anyway, I, I don't mind. Yeah. For some people, it's going to be a good fit. A cartoon's easy to watch. Uh, you know, a younger audience might enjoy it and, and, and sort of get something from it. But, um, yeah, it, 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 maybe it needs a, a stern message at the end, you know, and with, some, with someone in jail. <laughs> I don't mm. know. Um, but uh, you know, put it out to people to comment on that because um, I, you know, it's cool. The cartoon says what it is, but they're common sense rules and a lot of them are in place already. So they're just reinforcing the rules. Yeah. So this is happening after December 31, 2020. These are national rules in the EU. So individual member state regulations will be replaced by a common framework. Um, so that's going to be good from that perspective. Um, they do have privacy and, you know, the European Union is certainly known for their privacy concerns. Um, they are going to have three categories in their framework of open, specific and certified. So open is what anyone can do once they're registered. Um, so kind of like our existing framework in Australia, then specific medium risk operations um, to obtain certification in this category, you need to get authorization from the, um, the regulator and then certified is the top category, um, which is for everything that falls outside of the norm. For example, carrying dangerous goods or even a human passenger in the unmanned vehicle. It's rather funny that you talk about carrying a human passenger in an unmanned vehicle, but yes. Yeah, that's, that's one of the other things that's still trying to find a category for. Uh, in terms of you know, moving forward with um, with pe passenger carrying drones, if you like, um, so it's mm. a whole another area again that's you know very very interesting. And the most of the legislature around the world hasn't got anywhere near that yet. A lot of people are fighting for um, the experimental category or similar, like a, um, a, a a recreational experimental category that they have in the US. And Australia's adopted a lot of those things here for recreational mm. flying. Uh, at the end of the day, if you're sitting in something, it's got to have a red button in front of it that says, please land now. I'm a bit concerned with the smoke that's coming from the back engine. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot of things. We, we draw that line. Uh, it be interesting to see. Um, but, you know, we've, we've seen some fantastic passenger uh, carrying um, aircraft that are, that are being developed, the E-Hung. Um, you know, there's, there's heaps of them out there um, that are going to find space. And even that fishing drone that we've um, had the pilot, well, the reported pilot of that one on before, but we'll move on. We've got only a couple more stories left. And uh, the next one, actually, let's skip that for now. I'm going to go to the 1.10 for my producer. This one is a crane drone. And I'll just put it out there. Let's play the clip. Comment here is I'm an ordinary guy with a bit of bad luck that can't afford to pay for a new used drone right now. Um, Eric Palmer needs your support on how not to fly a drone. Just play that one more time. It was just a funny laugh there. 
And the reason I included this clip is um, I wanted to have it as a prelude to the next one. And this is what is listed as a sole drone clip. Let's go straight to the next one. Many people have lost their drone, but this video is not like any other lost drone clip that I've seen before. So he's going and doing a rocket launch and he accidentally lets go of his controller. Play that one more time. So you can see at the beginning, he's pressed the button, the drone's going up and there goes the controller down, 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 down. And John, have you frozen up? I haven't. I, I'm. I'm just looking at it with, with with a bit of shock. Actually, thinking I can see when he puts it down, like he's picking up something else. And uh, you know, one of those things. You know, just to point this out, that, um, last week when we had the flying um, uh, week, I noticed uh, one of the guys, and I'm um, forgive me, Lloyd might know who it was, had their screen on a tripod, and uh, and had the controller, so you didn't have the weight of the extra weight of the screen. And I know there's a Mel. little bit of a side issue, yeah, but but yeah, you know, you can look down yeah, and Mel. you can you can also easily manipulate it with you know using the two hands across one controller. I tried that this week, and it's a really good thing if you you know. I noticed one of the other flyers was sitting in a seat. Um, I like to sit down in a comfy chair while I'm flying. I find that more comfortable. But again, you know, if you get a lot of the times you might be standing on the side of a cliff, and if you do drop the controller or it slides down the hill. Um, you better hope you get a nice shot like that of it. The thing that we don't know, and by the way, again, as always, the video uh, links for all of these are in the description. I encourage everyone to go and check out the links, have a look at the original source material. What we don't hear is what happened um, if the controller, when it hit the bottom of the hill, um, stopped transmitting. And if that's the case, did the drone do an automated return to home after loss of signal? And there's so many questions there. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell us. But the I fact that he's got the footage, back. well, we yeah. the it fact that we've space. yeah, the fact that we've only got footage from um, the the ground camera. What does that well, tell you? I, I did a talk on this this week, and just it'll take two minutes. Oh, actually, it's no, it's not the ground camera. It's, it yeah. is from the drone. Just play that clip again. It's from the drone. Yeah. It's from the so drone. Must and must have got it back. Yeah, I don't – I think probably the drone came back home and – yeah. <laughs> I've got to watch Sam. this one more time. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Um, yeah, using a lanyard um, attached to your controller, it looks like you're a geek when you're doing it, but at least you know you're not going to lose your controller. It does. You know, I, Greg, I'll take one minute to explain because this might help some of our, our listeners that like to know that relationship between the controller and the aircraft. And, and there's a little bit of language that's used in, in our aircraft that's confusing. The flight controller, the actual flight controller, is on board the aircraft. If you like, it's the autopilot, it's the software, it's the chip. And we actually call that the flight controller. And the, you have a transmitter to send messages to the flight controller. And you have a screen which actually sends messages, interestingly, to the, the transmitter to send it to the flight controller. But the, in many ways, the way all of the DJI aircraft are set up is that the flight controller is really an autonomous, self-flying aeroplane that just waits for commands and it waiting for something. I'm giving you a new GPS position, move over here. I'm giving you another position. I'm giving you a camera instruction. And so when you lose a controller and it fails, of course, there are fail safes, but the airplane doesn't care. If the airplane has been told to do a, a flyaway shot like that, it will fly it beautifully and it'll sit in the hover and it'll wait for its next command. And the next command in that one, if you've lost the controller, would be, I have a certain battery level now and I'm going to fly home. I've, I've got that in my in my software. So it's an interesting thing to break it up. And knowing if you run out of battery on your iPad, what's going to happen? You're just going to lose that functionality of looking at the screen, but also of sending a message. But you, you, your transmitter will still work. And if you lose both, the, air, the flight controller is quite happy to do what it's going to do without other commands. So it's, a, it's mm. an interesting one to understand how it works. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, we get to the end of our news stories. Oh, there it goes again. But it is actually time for joking off now, rather <laughs> ironically. <laughs> so for Tom, who's sitting patiently in the background over there, Tom, this is a little bit of fun. And here's the deal. We're going to have you pick either John or Lloyd. You can pick one or the other, and you're going to tell a joke, and your objective is to make them laugh, and their objective is to keep straight face. So if your joke is good enough, you get a point. There's no prize. It's just a hell of a lot of fun. So who are you going to pick? If you're going to pick John or Lloyd? Um, and I don't have your mic on. Are you muted, muted. still? Oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? There we go. Yes, I can hear you. Who would you like to I'm, uh, tell your joke to? I'm going to go for Lloyd. Yeah, good choice. Yeah. Okay, Always. so we're going to have Lloyd. Uh, we'll switch to him as soon as you get far enough into the joke, but we'll leave you on screen just so we can see you're telling it. There we go. Okay, go ahead. So, Lloyd, why aren't koala bears actual bears? I don't know. They don't meet. They don't meet the qualification. Now I'll let you know in advance that Lloyd has used that joke before, so he kind of knew the punchline, and you were oh. stuffed from the beginning. <laughs> tough, uh, tough. I shouldn't have. No went good. The, I went for the Austra I went for the Australia joke. Yeah, that's a good yeah. idea. Yeah, it's never going to fuck. It's never yeah. going to work. Okay. Now, Lloyd, you've got one that you're going to yeah. tell back to Tom. You ready? Lloyd, your yeah. turn. <clears throat> it's more of a statement. I couldn't remember how to throw a boomerang, but it came back to me. <laughs> yes. You got it. Damn it, kid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you want to go for another one, Tom, against either John yeah. or another yeah. one against yeah, Lloyd? Do you want to try and get back? You know, the old one. Yeah. What, I, uh, what do you call a boomerang that doesn't come back? A stick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's an oldie. Okay, yeah. Tom, he, he, yeah. you're going to go for try and get another point up on Lloyd or you want to try John? I'll, uh, I'll try John. Okay. So whenever you're ready. All right, John. So a sandwich walks into a bar. The bartender says, sorry, we don't serve food here. <laughs> you picked the wrong one. Lloyd's laughing. <laughs> John's about to... I can see John snickering. That's it's a good gag. Up. It's a good gag. I like it. Uh, yeah, that was good. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. Okay. Um, John, you've got one back on uh, Tom now. Go for it. What do you got for us? Oh, um, you know, we could go, go back to Australian gags because I, I always like those. Let's do another really quick rhyming slang. Um, let's see. I, um, I went out the other day. It was a bit soldiers and I'd forgot my motor. So I went home and had a, a warm Tyrone, and then I had a my I used my Baden at the end of it. So there you go. It was a great day. <laughs> I just thought you might want to work that one out, but you know, leave it with you. I'm, I'm just laughing because Lloyd's laughing now. <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah, but the question is, do you know what he was talking about? No, no, you not wouldn't. a clue. Soldiers Bowl nope, is cold. Not a clue. It was a bit cold when I went out. I forgot my motorboat, my coat. Um, so I went home and had a Tyrone, Tyrone power shower, and I needed a Baden Powell, a towel. You know, I mean, it just goes, it's like a whole language. It's a fun language. Oh, God. So yeah. 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 Even T Bird says, What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Look, we've got to that point in the show where we've finished. I've got one video that we didn't play that I'm going to play at the end. But before we play that, I just want to say thanks for being with us today, Tom. It was lovely to have you in. Continue to chat in the background as we finish off today. But thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I'll come on anytime you guys want me. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you.
So um, back to the studio with John, and we're going to go to our last clip. And I thought this is just a, a feel-good kind of clip. Um, with all of the negative stuff that's happening in the world and social things happening around, this guy, um, Franz Knight, created what he describes as a stunning drone tour titled What Makes Michigan Great? And it was just a nice clip. Let's check it out. So certainly I'd love to have him come and chat to us as well about his photography. This is just beautiful. And similar to Drones Be Heard that we had on before, he's done some great things with some background audio. Is that coastline we saw earlier, it, um, Lloyd, is that um, the lakes? Like that, this, this here, is that the Great Lakes at Michigan? Yeah, I think it is. Man, it's incredible. The color of the water, I didn't think it was that color. It's like salt yeah. water. But the Great Lakes are fresh water, yeah? Look at that. So here's my ask to everyone here. This is a really, really awesome clip. Go and check it out yourself. That's go beautiful. to the description for our video and uh, go and click this one. This is the G. Anderson newsroom where it came from, but absolutely beautiful video. One of the things we have uh, hard to get our head around there is the size of the Great Lakes. I mean, we don't have a lake like that in Australia. We've got, we've got Salt Lake, big Salt Lakes, and Lake Air fills up pretty big. But the, that whole thing in the, in the middle of America, that massive lake where you've got big commercial shipping running through it, right? Is it, it, mm. it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, Nick says that's uh, uh, Lake Superior. So Lake Superior, wow. <coughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's right. And it's all fresh water, yeah? Yeah. And it, it probably yeah. comes from Canada too, am I right? Is it? Is it come down from Canada? Yeah, it's kind of the dividing between Canada and uh, the United States, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't want to seem like I don't know the geography, but as it said, I know, I know sort of where it sits and where it all fits, but the actual expanse of it to me, you know, even coming from a place like where we live, it, it's phenomenal to think about how big those lakes are. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful footage. And again, go do check out his channel. And we've reached that part of the show where it's almost time to say goodbye. But before we do, I'm going to press some buttons and maybe some titles will come up. There's one. And if you want to send us any footage, send it to upload at gregcoonit.com. And we'll be happy to include that if you want to be a guest on the show. Same thing, upload at gregcoonit.com. Do me a favor, follow us on different social media platforms. And here's a big ask for everyone today. Go and um, take this video that you're watching right now on YouTube and press the share button. Get some of your mates to go and watch it. Um, that would be really helpful. And if you've got anything physical you want to send, you can reach us at 5 slash 127 Princess Highway, Sylvania, New South Wales, triple two four. Okay, that's all that we've got here today. It's been good having you in, as always, uh, Tom and Lloydie. John, last words from you. Yeah, look, fly safe, everybody. Have a great time. I know, you know, it's probably a good time if you've got some extra time on your hands to get some flying practice in. Um, go find somewhere quiet to go and, and keep racking up those hours. Yep. And uh, our guest, last words from you. He's still there. Yeah. Uh, he's, Thank you. Yep. Thanks for having me. Um, if we can actually go back to the Great Lakes, I live uh, right in the middle of Lake Superior and Lake Huron. Wow. Okay. So uh, that's a... Oh. We lost well, him. Well, we lost him. We lasted a long time, but <laughs> we got to that point and then he disappeared. Oh, oh, he's, he's back. He's back. Uh, Are we good? Are we good? Yeah. We're yeah, good. back. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what mm -hmm. happened there. Yeah. So, yeah, you live in that area. You're going to have to go and check out this other pilot and uh, go and meet yeah, up with him. Yeah, that that was a place called uh, Pictured Rock. Okay. 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 Yeah. It's, uh, it's a very nice area. It's pretty close to where I live. It's about a three, four-hour drive. Okay, beautiful. 
And uh, Lloyd, last words from you. Well, I was just glad glad that I got to beat the kid, you know, on the jokes, and uh, it actually was a real, it was fun having him on. And I've actually been right through where he lives uh, years ago. I drove up through Sault Ste. Marie, up went up over uh, which lake is it? Uh, uh, lake Huron, Lake yeah, Superior. yeah. Yeah, Lake Superior. I went up over the top of Lake Superior through Canada and came back down over by Minnesota. So yeah, Lake Superior. But anyways, it was a great show tonight, guys, and uh, uh, great guest. It's always good seeing John too. And uh, but see you guys on Art Show Sunday, Mel Show Sunday, and my show Monday. Okay. Yep. Thanks, Lloyd. Thank you, Lloyd. Thank you, John. Thanks for everyone for watching today and. Uh, have a great week. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye safe, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.